All right, here we go. We left off at Genesis chapter 11, and then we left off at verse, let's see here, Nahor. We left off at verse 30. Remember, we were talking about Sarai. Her name is not Sarah. It's Sarai, remember. So Sarai, uh, it meant uh, the contentious one. And then we covered some interesting verses on that, how the Lord changed her life, changed her perceptive, and we compared it with 1 Peter chapter 3. Now we're going to contemplate a little bit more about Abram. Uh, remember his name meant high father. And it seemed like that the Lord had a sense of humor where he didn't uh, give him any children. So, so much for being high father. Yeah. So he wasn't a father of anything now. Hence the Lord, what he did was change his name later on to Abraham. So right now his name is Abram. It's not Abraham yet. So remember that his name, his original name, is Abram, which means high father. Abraham, we're going to find out later on, it means father of many nations. As we continue on, we're studying Abram's genealogy, his family. What was his family life like? Well, we know that he came from Ur of the Chaldees. So coming from Ur of the Chaldees right here, it was a rich civilization that time if you study its history. The closest connections where you would have any remnants of Nimrod's religion, Nimrod's civilization, Ur of the Chaldees was one of them. Abram came from that type of land, that kind of civilization. So that's where his, he grew up in, he was born, and his family also lived. But then the family, they left Ur of the Chaldees. If you recall Genesis chapter 10, it seems like that when there's a city built, Sometimes family and people, they'll leave their, the land of their nativity, their city, because they want to go to the suburban or to the rural areas. So they want to start their own uh, family tree, their own civilization, perhaps. But we've seen that with Genesis 5, Genesis 10. So this is typical with Abram's family during that time. Okay, so the Tower of Babel, or of the Chaldees, he's leaving off that civilization and we can see what the Lord's doing. The Lord, he wants to start something clean. Because remember Genesis 10, when you read all the nations, they've all been corrupted. They've all been corrupted by mankind's uh, system and Nimrod's religion. So it's totally messed up right now. I mean, totally messed up. God wants to start a brand new group of people because obviously he can't send a worldwide flood anymore. Uh, he gave a promise to Noah. So instead of wiping mankind out again, because trust me, even if he wipes them out again, they're going to do it again. Amen. So God knows that. So then what he decided to do was just start a brand new nation, which is the children of Israel. And that's the reason why the children of Israel, they were supposed to be very pure in their language as a people. You talk about strict segregation laws and everything. Why? Because remember in Genesis 10, they kept commingling. And then Genesis 11, we see the epitome of their commingling where... They were building their one world government. Like they would have brought down the devil. We wouldn't need to go to the tribulation or the Antichrist. Nimrod would have been that one. However, the Lord stopped it. The Lord stopped it. But then mankind, they're doing it again. Nimrod, he got them in unison through at least his religion. So even though they were divided in languages and cultures, they did carry his religion with them. So then God saw that, and then he wanted to start something brand new. So then we're starting off with Abram. Let's understand his family, his background a little bit more. Verse 31, And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. Okay, so let's discuss this family tree so that no one's lost. Remember, Haran is Abram's brother. Aaron, he had a son named Lot. So then, as I taught you last Genesis study, the Bible never said grandpa or grandson. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. So the way that it words it would be, if you look at verse 31, Lot, the son of Haran. So Lot is Haran's son. You'll notice that in the drawing. But notice his son's son. 
So it's talking about Haran's, uh, no, it's talking about Terah's son's son. See, so Terah's son's son. That's the idea. Terah's son's son. That's the idea. So basically his grandson. So that's how the family works. Abram is obviously Terah's son. Lot, the, Lot is his son's son. Sarai is the daughter-in-law. And then he, uh, Sarai is Abram's wife. And Abram is Terah's son. So I'm trying to explain every word so that no one gets lost here. Now, remember Sarai, she's also the daughter of Terah. So Abram and Sarai... Uh, they're brothers and sisters, but it's more like half-brother, half-sister. And I'm not going to uh, debunk the incest factor over here or the inbreeding factor here. I already covered that in Genesis 5. So that's a common, inf uh, common infamous argument you'll hear from atheists. That, uh, you know, the only way you can reproduce was through brothers and sisters having relationships with each other if you started with Adam and Eve. That's right. So then that's what uh, the atheists... They have a hard time understanding, they'll critique it, but I already debunked that at Genesis 5. I'm not going to debunk it here, okay? Now, uh, continuing on here, so then Sarai, the relationship is that she is Terah's daughter, but then she's like the half-sister of Abr Abram, but then became his wife. So then they became husband and wife here. So then it shows here that Terah, that he must have had multiple wives. And that's common if you look at Genesis 5. Remember, that was the start of polygamy. So then Terah had uh, multiple wives, or it could be that his wife died and then he had to marry another woman. So it could be that way. Now, returning to the text at Genesis uh, 11. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, so, all of Terah's family tree here, they went with him from Ur of the Chaldees. They're leaving, like I told you. Let's keep reading. To go into the land of Canaan. So then, what it seemed like is that Terah was heading toward the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. But then they ended up in a land called Haran and dwelt there. Now, remember, Haran is Terah's son. Remember that? But then I taught you, uh, let's see, did I teach this? No, I didn't teach that uh, part yet. So then, notice that he comes to a land called Haran, though, even though it's supposed to be his son, right? Not a location. Well, it's pretty obvious. The reason why uh, the place and location is Haran is because, remember, his son died a long time ago. So when his son died a long time ago, and then he came to this land called Haran, obviously didn't have a name yet, so he named it Haran. Why is that? Because in memory of his son that passed away. Now remember, that is very common. When you look at Genesis 10, that there are people who move to different locations, and they named locations after their own genealogy or family name somehow. So that was common at Genesis 10 that I taught you before. So this is not something new or something strange. This was very common that time. Because remember, they were spreading out. They were spreading out. They were migrating. They were taking territories for themselves. Continuing onward. Uh, they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So then they lived in Haran. Okay. So the family left Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. On the way, however, they didn't really make it to Canaan. On the way, it was at Haran. So then let's put some uh, line, uh, this line here, that way people can follow what's going on. They leave here, they go to Haran, which is also his son's name as well, place and son. They were supposed to go here, but what happened to Terah? He didn't get to here. He died at this place. So sun and place. Let's see what happens. 
verse 32, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So Terah, all of his days that he lived was about 205 years. So you'll notice that in this chart, he, he lived up to 205. But then uh, he died in Haran. So he died at the place where he took the name after his son. As we continue reading on, we're actually going to come across a few areas that's going to contradict. If we go back to Genesis chapter 11, and then verse 27 through 32, these numbers are right, okay? Remember, when Terah was 70, that's when Abram was supposedly born, okay? If you go back to those verses that we saw earlier. So then it looked like that Abram was supposedly born when Terah was 70. And then uh, there seems, uh, when he's 145, then Abram would be supposedly 75. And then he died at 205. Now 75 is important because there's a contradiction, it seems like, in your King James Bible. But just remember this. I'm going to show you later. Okay? Let's go to Genesis 12.1. Now we begin Abram's story. We understand his family, his background. So his father died here. Now let's see what happens. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, so now God is speaking to Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Okay, he told Abram, you get out of your country from your kindred, so your family, and from thy father's house, anything that has to do with your father, to where? A land that I'm going to show you. So God promised that he's going to give them a land that, uh, he never, uh, that he's going to show them. So that's what God intended. Now, uh, there are some things here that seems to be a little bit confusing. What seems a little bit confusing is this, is that Terah, remember, he was on his way to Canaan from here, right? But then God says to Abram, I'm going to show you a land, uh, I'm going to take you to a land that I'm going to show you. Turns out we know where it is. It is Canaan. So what in the world is going on here, right? That's the question. As a matter of fact, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. As a matter of fact, it's a place that Abraham doesn't really know 100%, it seems like. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at Ab Hebrews chapter 11 and then verse 8. Notice right here, Abram didn't even know where he was going. Okay? So God said, I'm going to take you to a land that I'm going to show you. It turned out to be the place where his family was originally heading toward, right? But then it's a place that Abram didn't know, God says. So what's going on? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance. Now we know that's Canaan, right? But then look what happened. Obeyed, and he went out, what? Not knowing whither he went. He had no idea where he was going. So what in the world is going on? Uh, there are two theories here, okay? One theory, which might be something that will speak to you. One theory is that God wanted to test Abram because he says, you got to separate from your family. That's what Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says. You can imagine what was going on in Abram's mind. He lost his brother. He lost his father. Okay, so that's pretty heavy for him. And then he's got to carry on his family lineage. But the Bible says, no, you're separating from that. Can you imagine that family's like, hey, you know, we need you, Abram, to continue this family. We just left Ur of the Chaldees, and somebody's got to keep the family tree going. But Abram says, no, I got to go. Where are you going? I don't know, but I just got to go. I'll tell you what, if you had one person in your family acting like that uh, in a typical Asian home, then you might get pretty offended. You might go, you disgrace and dishonor your whole family tree, and who do you think you are? And why? Because the father died, and then the brother died. So then, uh, remember, Abram comes from a Shemitic line, okay, which the Asians come from. So that community mindset, he had to forsake and give up that. That takes a lot of faith. So it could be that in Abram's case, 
when he went out by faith, that the Lord, he had every intention in the world that I'm not going to do it through Terah, I'm going to do it through you. So what the family had in mind to go to Canaan, I know your family's desires. You'd be surprised I'd give it to you, but I want to see how much you go out by faith and sacrifice and give up your family for what I want you to do, Abram. And if you've been saved for a while, you do know God works that way. Yeah, you do know God works that way. A lot of times, you know, it's hard to give up our desire, hard to sacrifice something we're very close to. But what God does is that until you surrender at first, you'd be surprised how well I would take care of you. And even how much of your own desires that you gave up, the Lord just gives it back to you. Now, you might say, why would God do that? Because nothing's too hard for, for God. Amen. Do you think it's so hard for God to give you back uh, the desire? He wants you not to stick to your desire. Why? Because it's too small. It's only a part of the bigger thing that he's going to give to you. He's like, you know, this thing's too small. Give it up. Let me give you this big thing. And you'd be surprised. It might include this small thing in the package, this small desire of yours. And that's how God honors it. But he wants to see you not know first. Why? He wants to see you give up and sacrifice first. Now, I am a witness of that, and I know there are people here who've been, who are witnesses of that. Why? Because you've seen how God done that before. Amen. The desire you were so afraid to take, for God to take it away, He just gave it back to you. But He wanted to test you first. Uh, isn't that the case with His son Isaac? God wanted to test him. Let's see you give up your only begotten son. And then what? God gave him back. Wow. That's how God works. A lot of times he will, uh, there are times he will take away the desire, but you'd be surprised how many times he lets you keep the desires. Right. But, you got, but God wants to see your heart first. He wants to see the sacrifice. Even if those old desires go away, one thing that I learned from God is he changes your desires after that. Once you sacrifice, give up your old desire, he changes your desires. That's, that is if you're willing, though, to let him work in you. If you're not willing to let him work in you, then he can't change your desires. And then you're going to understand that, man, thank God I'm still not that two-year-old having the same old desires for that same old toy. But then what happens is, is that uh, the same old uh, desire where you had uh, the same old toys, it's gone now. It's gone and it's changed to where uh, you, uh, you can have new desires. And then you're thankful, especially when you're 30-something years old, you're like, yeah, those old desires don't get to me anymore. I have a new desire now, Amen. right? When you guys turn 30, 40, 50, 20, something like that, it's not the same desires as a yeah, two-year-old, that's right. all right? It is a very, so then you have to understand that's, uh, what you are spiritually too. You're babes in Christ. And being a babe in Christ, you don't want to remain locked up in that immature mindset. You want to get out of that immature mindset, take the mature mindset where you grow spiritually in the Lord. And then when you mature as a spiritually grown adult, then you understand that. And you're actually grateful you're not stuck there yeah. in the same old desires that are immature. So that's Abram's case one. That's possibility one. Possibility two is this is what Dr. Ruckman said, which is pretty interesting. Uh, return to Genesis uh, return to Genesis 12 and Genesis 11. Return to Genesis 12 and then return to Genesis 11. Now, Notice that God says that he wants him to depart from his family's home, right? The verse could read at verse 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, meaning that it's not in sequential order continuing the story. The way that it's worded is as if, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, meaning like that past tense, Now God spoke some time ago to Abram. What? So then in verse 27 through 32, when all that action was happening with Terah leaving Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan during all that time, it could be that when Terah went from Ur of the Chaldees and then to Haran to go to Canaan, now it was about some time ago that God told Abram that, hey, I want you to leave your family. See, so in other words, that chapter 12 verse 1 is not after Terah died. It could be 
before. It could be before they even moved out of Ur of the Chaldees. Now, why do I say that? Why I say that is this, is that Abram, he had a problem. All right, we're going to jump to verse 3. I'll expound verse 2 later, but jump to verse 3. Uh, verse uh, 4, excuse me. Notice when Abram left, he took Lot, his nephew, with him. So he didn't fully obey God's command. God said, you're going to separate from your family. You're going to go out by faith by yourself. And Abram, he did sacrifice for the Lord, but not completely. There was something he took with him, Lot. Well then, wouldn't it sound logical that he took Terah, his father, with him? If chapter 12, verse 1, is before Terah died, it's, uh, it's before Terah even left Ur of the Chaldees, then it could be this way. And this is what Dr. Uckman taught. Now basically, Abram, he first caught the word from the Lord to get out of the, notice chapter 12, verse 1, his kindred, his family, his country. So it's not really Haran then, okay? It would be more of the land of his nativity, or of the Chaldees, because that's where his family grew up and uh, they stayed in. So then it could be that when they left Ur of the Chaldees, uh, when Abram left Ur of the Chaldees, okay, go, leave here to go to the land that uh, I will tell thee of, all right? And Abram didn't know about that. But then the Holy Spirit was keeping record that they were heading toward Canaan, right? It didn't say that they knew about it. It just said they were heading toward Canaan. Why? Because God was guiding Abram to Canaan. But Terah went along with him, if you notice Genesis chapter 11. So it could be Abram that when he left his homeland, he couldn't leave Lot and he couldn't leave his father or his family. So then there were some part of his family that probably his close family members that he took along with him to go over here. So then the Lord had to teach Abram a lesson where Terah couldn't make it all the way and he died midway. So maybe the Lord did that. And then it would make sense because that is God's character. Sometimes when you sacrifice something for the Lord, you do see his blessing and he honors you, but there are still some of that little remaining part that's hidden that you kept for yourself. And you're like, Lord, I'll sacrifice this much, but I need to take some of this little stuff with me. Good advice is this, don't do that. God will take it away from you. Why? Because God, if that was the case with Terah, God did take him away. And guess what? He did that with Lot. And it's a very worse case with Lot. Much worse. Lot ended up with, uh, uh, as you know the story, he slept with his own daughters. He lost his cities uh, and everything. It was a sad ending. Maybe it would have been better for Lot if he stayed over here yeah. rather than go to Sodom. Yeah. Maybe it would have fared better for him. Even though he's back and he's not right with God, at least he's better over here than in Sodom. So maybe the Lord did that for best intentions. But God's going to do that. My good advice is this, because I've seen it happen. It's very, very ugly. When you sacrifice for the Lord, do not keep these remaining small things. If you do, one day it will hurt you hard. And if, it, and if you think that, well, I didn't, get, uh, I didn't bite the dust yet, Trust me, there's someone close to you that will bite the dust. When God told you to give up something, he's not only thinking about your benefits sometimes, he's sometimes thinking about other people around you sometimes. Okay? We're very selfish creatures. When we have our desire, let's be very honest, we're not thinking about our loved ones, we're thinking about ourselves. You might think you think about your loved ones, but in reality, no, not really. It's what you truly desire. That's what it comes down to the bottom line. That's human nature. We're built that way. Why do you say we? Because I'm included in there too. So I have to keep an eye out on that. I have to interrogate myself. Why do you interrogate yourself? Because I don't trust myself. It's called flesh. I never trust this guy. Even if my flesh has good intentions, I don't trust my good intentions. I hope you don't too. If there's a number one person you should mistrust, it's not your spouse. It's you. Any husband and wife want to get on the altar right now? It's so easy to critique a uh, fellow spouse, but then it's easy to justify yourself, right? Yeah. Because you have good intentions. Mm. But guess what? One thing I learned, everybody has good intentions when they argue. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right? You're just built-in wicked flesh. The number one person you should interrogate is yourself. Amen. All right, I just had to throw that in there as a bonus. All right, let's go back here. Let's go back. 
Now, when we return to the main text here, so let's talk about Abram then, his faith. So then, with his faith here, we've discovered something uh, admirable about Abram. So Abram, he, he had some lingering issues. We saw that. But nevertheless, we've seen how God incredibly blessed him. So it shows God's goodness. God, you'd be surprised how much God will honor your sacrifice. Just give it to him. Why does he want to take the remainder parts, you might say? My remaining desires. Because those remaining desires he knows will hurt you. So you got to give up those remaining desires. That way you can fully enjoy his blessing he planned out for you. Okay? All right. Now, uh, let's talk about the good points. We already discussed his bad points. Let's talk about his good points with Abram. He lived by faith when he went out. He had no idea where he was going, remember. He had no idea. Just went out by faith to a country that he had no idea to go. And then the Bible says when you go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, go back to Hebrews 11, and then uh, reading verse 8 again, reading verse 8 again, the Bible says, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. So notice right here that uh, the Lord, he was concentrating. The Lord not only looks at your bad points, he looks at your good points, you have to understand. Thank you. Thank you. So you might say, well, I messed up here, I messed up here. But hey, it doesn't change the fact that, um, let me pull this as an example. Well, I messed up this sin at home and then I, uh, I had anger issues again. I fell to the same trap of sin again. And then I haven't came to church for a while. Well, hey, at least you're here today. Amen. Why can't you look at that good point? And then you don't think God won't honor that faith. So the Lord, he, you got to understand this about God's nature. Our problem is we mingled the good and the bad. But God, he divides it. He rightly divides. When you do bad, he focuses on your bad and there's nothing good about it. But your human unconscious mind is so wicked, you mingle something good in there. And then when God rightly divides something that's good over here, and then he wants to credit you, reward you, your uh, human unconscious mind puts something bad and negative in here. You know, this is your problem. Right? You have a huge problem with that one. You got to uh, divide the things. And whatever is good, rejoice in it and take heart and enjoy it. Whatever is bad, don't justify it and realize that it's rotten. Okay, that's what God does. So notice that God, Amen. I know you can think of that, well, Abraham didn't obey. Why did the Bible say in verse 8 he obeyed? Well, that's your human problem. You're concentrating on his bad. God's concentrating on his good point here. He left his homeland. That's the point. He left his homeland. That's the point. Verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So notice that all of this is true. He never mentioned about where Abram uh, took Terah and Lot. It didn't, it didn't focus on that part. It was focusing on what he did right. What was the point he did right? He left his homeland. Isn't that what he did? Okay, then God's like, okay, I honor that. I'll bless that. So then he did obey. In this point right here, he obeyed. The other parts that he didn't obey, God already took care of that and said, that's bad, that's messed up. It's that simple. Now, when we look at here, then he was sojourning in, a, in Canaan. It's called the land of promise. And it's a strange place. And, you know, he never really settled. He never really built a city like Nimrod did. He was a wanderer. He, you have to understand that within this land of Canaan, he was wandering, he was living in tents, and then he was sojourning. I mean, uh, he was kind of like us, you know, when we were wandering, right? Without a home. So then, but what was that? All an act of faith, just going by faith, trusting in God, and look, I don't know where this place is, where God's going to put us in, but I'm just going to go out by faith and set up the chair and... Drive one hour, and then the next week, drive one hour and 30 minutes because we changed locations. 
put my 10 over here. And yeah, it's a pain to carry these hymn books, but I'm, it's not going to take away my shout. Yeah. And yeah, maybe yeah. that the preaching, it may be pretty hard at times because it's a different atmosphere. But I'm going to shut my mouth and listen to the preaching yeah, yeah, yeah. and don't let the atmosphere of the environment affect my mood. And then it's all see an act of faith. That's, good. Yeah. That's what Abram did. And then the Lord says, well, because you obeyed, I'm going to bless you for that. All right, let's go back here at Hebrews chapter 11. Now, this is very important to understand. Isaac and Jacob are included here in verse 9 as wanderers. So it's not just Abram. You have to understand that Isaac and Jacob, his later generations. So in other words, Abram, throughout, or Abraham in this case, throughout his entire life never got to live in a prosperous kingdom like Nimrod did. Once Nimrod settled, he built it up and advanced it. Abraham never got that. But guess what? Neither did his later generations. Do you realize how much faith that is? Imagine wandering, not just your entire life, but you know your children are going to end up like that. And those children have to cha train their children to do that too. That takes a lot of faith, yeah, isn't it? it so then Isaac and Jacob never settled either. They never lived in a prosperous kingdom. They always wandered. So then what happened? So we go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And then notice in verse 10, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. See, that's what he was looking at. What Abram was looking was not on the earthly things. He was looking more at God being the builder and the maker at the end. So he kept his affection on things above on things of this earth. That took a lot of faith. And guess what? Abraham got, his, Abraham got his reward. You know what he is now? Because of that, his whole, uh, his whole descendants are going to rule the entire world for eternity. And the, all the credit of the Jews who will live that way, they always say, I'm a father of not Adam, not Noah, not Shem. They always say, Abraham. So... God went beyond Abraham, Abraham's expectations. Do you imagine what kind of faith he had where even till the day he died, he never got to see that land? But he was living in it. Yeah. He was living in it. He was just wandering. But then he got to see it now, and he will see it more for eternity. Amen. So remember, God will bless you beyond even more of what you expect. Don't think so little of God. That's your problem. You know what your problem is? Is that when you go out by faith and you sacrifice this and this and this, you think too little of God. You got to realize God goes beyond your expectation. Well, what if I don't even see it in my entire lifetime, right? Hey, uh, Abraham, that was a lot of faith. He didn't see that for his entire lifetime. And not only that, the next two generations, they never saw that. But guess what happened? God's not looking only at his generation or the next two generations. I'm like, I'm better than that. Why can't you just trust me? I'm looking at your endless generations till the end, from you till the end of time. And God bless them. And uh, guess what? His promise is not done yet. In time, what's going to happen in the future, Israel will rule the entire world one day. Uh, not just a thousand years, but for all eternity. That's really huge. That's really huge. That's worth living 200 years of your life for. You might say, why? Because when you hit eternity, 200 years look like a blink of an eye to you. All right, go back. Go back. So that's quite a faith that Abraham had. Uh, Dr. Ruckman in his Genesis commentary has some good things about Abraham here. We studied some good points about Sarah. Uh, let's look at some things about Abraham. Dr. Ruckman says on page 308 of his Genesis commentary... Some really good stuff. And I'll write some of this stuff down as best as I can. Uh, Abram is the tenth from Noah. Now, if you know your Bible, ten is a Gentile number. But Abram is a Jew. No, he started the Jewish race. He was a Gentile before. He was born a Gentile, too. Then later on, he became a Jew when they went through circumcision at Genesis chapter. Uh, we see later on, uh, I'll show you later on when we keep covering our Genesis studies. But uh, he is called a Hebrew at Genesis chapter 
14, verse 13. So that's when he was, the first mention we see of the Jews or Hebrews is right here at Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13. But it is interesting that uh, later on about Abram, he is the king of the fathers and is always given first in the Trinity, Trinity formula, actually. So isn't it interesting that there's a Trinity formula right here? Uh, we say we baptize, we baptize you in the name of the Father first, and after that Son, and then Holy Ghost. The Trinitarian formula in Abraham's case right here is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because there was no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remember, at that time. So then during the Old Testament, it would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That would be the names. So then he comes out with the, uh, the tr Trinity formula when describing God. Remember, Moses says, uh, when the people ask me who's uh, my God, what can I say? God didn't say the Lord Jesus Christ all of a sudden. This is long, later on in the New Testament, we recognize Jesus as God. What they did was, God said, just tell them the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's a, a huge honor to Abram that you got to know. The name Abram or Abraham occurs in the Bible more than 250 times. Isaac pictures God the Son. There's no doubt about that. We see that in Galatians chapter 3. And chapter 4. Interesting, uh, when you read the story of Abraham about to sacrifice his son Isaac, the Bible says, uh, thine only son. You compare that with John 3.16, 3, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. First mention of love in your Bible was not uh, Adam and Eve. It wasn't a husband and wife or a lover with lover. It was actually father and son. That's the first mention of love in your Bible. Uh, let's see right here. So Abraham pictures God the Father. We see that the case with when he was about to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh, we see uh, here are two other passages if you want to write them down. Here are the following verses. Luke chapter 16, uh, verse 19 through 24. That's another, uh, these other two passages would picture that. And then the second one would be uh, let's see here, John chapter 8. Let's see, I'm going to have to write it here. And the verses will be 37 through 41. Here's a good one. Uh, these are the two verses you want to write down about Abram. Abram was known as uh, the friend of God, you have to understand. That was his title. Here are the two passages, and we're going to turn there. Go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. And we're going to look at chapter 41 in James 2. James 2. Isaiah 41 James 2. All right. Isaiah chapter 41 and then uh, James chapter 2 and then we'll look at verse 3 verse 3 all right now the word of God points out in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8 but thou Israel art my servant Jacob whom I have chosen the seed of Abraham my what Friend, okay, that's quite a big compliment. Abraham, I mean, imagine God calling you, you're my friend. Amen. Now, uh, if you get like uh, big preacher names that you've heard about before, you know, like Peter Ruckman, David Peacock, and then all these other big names that you've heard about. And then they said, and then imagine like randomly they point at you and, hey, that's my friend there. You know how you would feel? You go like, oh my goodness, call me a friend. Look at the... Look at the secular world today. If there's a Hollywood celebrity saying, yeah, yeah, that's my friend over there, they go psycho mode. Ah, he called me a friend. You know, something like that. 
So that's a huge high honor to the people. But imagine the king of kings, lord of lords, who created all life and breath. Called you his friend. That's very special then. That means you're a very special person to him. Amen. That's a huge honor right there. So look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. This man was something else, Abraham. Go to James chapter 2 and then we'll look at verse 23. The Bible reads here, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called, notice, the friend of God. That's quite a title. You don't see that. You don't see that much in your Bible, actually, where God called the person my friend. Abraham, though, he called him his friend. Uh, his salvation in Genesis 15 is a type of New Testament salvation revealed to Paul. And we're going to see that later. So then Abraham is a type of New Testament salvation. You compare that with Genesis 15 and Romans 4, and we'll do that later on when we get to that chapter. <coughs> so wait a minute, isn't he supposed to be uh, the father of something that's strictly Israel? Isn't that funny? But then we see the greatest type, or one of the greatest types of a Christian salvation here. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's a huge thing that Abram received. Huge compliment. So basically, uh, what he became right here, according to Genesis chapter 12, in Genesis chapter 12, what he called him right here is basically, uh, let's see, he called the nations, let's see, that's... Okay, so it's not in this passage yet. But uh, in Genesis, uh, later chapters in Genesis, God, what he had Abram was starting out a specific country called Israel, but then he called him father of many nations later on. Why is that? Because God's going to include uh, every saved Gentile to be a child of Abram as well. So God did two applications that Abraham was the father of physical, literal, national children through Israel. But then God did also a father spirit on a spiritual plane too. Of et, nobody, uh, anybody's nationality, doesn't matter who you are, you're a child of Abraham spiritually. So God did that. That's a huge blessing that Abraham received and he had no idea. He just went out by faith, believed God. Now, uh, you got to learn to just trust the Lord after that. You can't just uh, go by what you want to do in life. If you just go out by faith, you'd be surprised how much God will bless you even much more than you expect. Amen. He leaves home by faith, forsakes Lot by faith, offers up his, which is later on, we'll find out, offers up his son by faith and sojourns by faith in a land which he never received as a permanent inheritance yet. We saw that. Father Abraham is a legendary figure to the nation of Israel. To the believer, Abraham is the epitome of the life of faith. So to the Jew, a legend. To the believer, one of the greatest examples of faith. He walked in the spirit and not after the flesh, even with all the frailties. So in spite of his mess ups, right? But God still used him, blessed him. You'd be surprised how much the Lord will do that. Abraham's record of godliness is preserved for heaven and earth to marvel at. For heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word shall not. Amen. As an earthen vessel subject to the same temptations as other vessels of dust and ashes, Abram refuses fellowship with the ungodly. And then I'm going to quote all these verses right here, so I don't know if I can uh, write them all down. But Abram, look at all the examples right here. All right, they're too much to count, so I'm going to have to kneel here. Fellowship with the ungodly, he separated and forsook. That took a lot of faith. Another one was, uh, that's Genesis chapter 13, verse 11. Genesis 13, 11. And then I don't think I'll be able to write all this down, but I'll write as best as I can. Offers others the preeminent place. We've seen that with Lot. So others, that's Genesis chapter 13, and then verse 9, verse 9. 
has respect for his testimony before unbelievers. So that's Genesis chapter 13, verse 8. So he's wondering about how others look at me. I want to make sure that uh, my testimony is not ruined in any way. That took faith. What took faith? He let others have the better portion of the land, better parts, not him. That took faith. Worships God in spirit and in truth. So his worship was right. That's Genesis chapter 13 again. And verse 18. Genesis 13, 18. That took faith. See, there's no doubt he's the epitome example of faith uh, to the believer that you want to follow. Endangers his own life for the brethren. So that's uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 13 through 16. So the brethren, he was able to endanger his own life to help out a brother or a sister. So that's Genesis chapter 14, verse 13 through 16. Another example of Abraham's faith, as mentioned here, uh, refuses to be bribed or rewarded by the heathen. Okay, so he's not going to be rewarded by the world. He refuses that, all right? Rewards, rewards of the lost. He refuses it. That took faith. That what, um, that's mentioned at Genesis chapter 14, verse 22 through 23. All right, I won't be able to cover the rest here. There's too much, but you can write these down. And then if you watch this online, uh, you can pause and rewind. Ties his own riches. He ties his own riches. That's Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. Genesis 14, verse 20. So that means a tenth of his whole income, he gave it up to the Lord. Believes the impossible by faith. That's Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. Genesis 15, verse 16. He believes the impossible by faith. So what did God say? I'm going to give you a son. But then Abraham, he's old. There's no way he's going to have children. But then the Lord, he says, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So he, he took it by faith. The Lord rewarded. Sacrifices to the true God. He sacrifices to the true God. That's Genesis chapter 15, verse 9 through 10. Genesis chapter 15, verse 9 through 10. So he was willing to sacrifice, give up everything he has for the one true God, not for his own life or for the world. Obeys orders from God without question. Obeys orders from God without question. That's Genesis chapter 17, verse 26. Genesis chapter 17, verse 26. So no matter what God called the ridiculous out of Abraham, even about sacrificing his own son, no questions whatsoever. He did it. Compared to other Christians, we always critique and then we always whine and we always question God. The first thing in our minds as we go through suffering is the word, can you guess? Why? <laughs> That's always in our minds first, right? Why? Uh, let's see here. Uh, prays and intercedes for the brethren. He prays and intercedes for the brethren. That's Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. He believes in the literal resurrection. He believes in the literal resurrection. He believed that his son Isaac was going to come back to life after he killed him. That took a lot of faith from Abraham. Why? Why did he believe his son would resurrect? Because God promised Isaac would be the seed. So God is going to resurrect my son. I took faith. That's Genesis 22, verse 5. Genesis 22, verse 5. To the place, uh, he believed in the literal resurrection, to the place where he would bet the life of his only son on the truth of that doctrine too. That's huge. Genesis chapter 22, verse 10. Genesis chapter 22, verse 10. Abraham is indeed a marvel of faith for the 20th century men. Uh, so this is Ruckman written from the early days, obviously. To gape at in unbelief. Obviously, those who don't have faith, obviously the first thing in their minds is or disgust or disdain or question. But to those of us who are already accepted the faith, this is something that strengthens us. This is something that emboldens us. Truly, he was the friend of God that we see at the book of James chapter 2. All right, so that's a lot of good things about uh, Abram and Abraham to learn about. Now... 
we look at, uh, let's see right here. What I'm going to do is, uh, for the remaining few minutes, I'm going to cover a supposed contradiction because I don't have time. I'll, so there's a supposed contradiction here, which is why I wrote out these numbers. Okay, if you jump ahead later on at Genesis chapter 12, and then verse 4, at verse 4, Abraham, he left at 75. Okay, so he left at 75. Remember, Terah was 70 when he gave, when Abraham was born. Wait, then Terah is how old then? 145. But wait, Abraham, he left uh, when Terah was 145 right here. So there seems to be a contradiction because he dies at 205. So then there are false manuscripts out there that would try to shorten Terah's life to try to match up the numbers or etc. No, you just... Uh, Read the word of God as it says. People aren't reading. If you go back here at Genesis chapter 11. If you look at Genesis chapter 11 right here. We see at verse, 20, uh, verse 26. Verse 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in the Ur of the Chaldees. So notice right here that when we look at verse 26, Terah was 70 years old when, Abr when Abram, Nahor, and Haran came out. And then it says right here, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. Then we see right here, Terah... Uh, he died later on at verse 32 in Haran. Now, there are several things that could be answered right here. The several things to point out that could be answered is that, uh, one, if uh, Dr. Uckman's theory is true, perhaps it can work out right here, where when Abram was 75, when he left Ur of the Chaldees, he took Terah with him. So then he took Terah with him, and then Terah could have died midway. But I think that's not going to work because uh, he still has a lot of time left after that. And then obvious, and there's a lot of things that took place with Abraham already in this land. So I think that's not going to really work out. Uh, Dr. Ruckman, he gives this solution, which is, uh, which is pretty common sense. If you look at verse 27, Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Verse 26, Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. All right, here's the idea. We automatically make the assumption that when Terah was 70, that all of a sudden Abram was born. No, that's not what it means right here. Remember, if you read your Bible, uh, when the Bible says Shem, Ham, and Japheth, we find out that Shem is younger than one of these brothers. So that order is not chronological of their years. What it points out right here is that Terah, he starts to give birth, uh, he, he starts to have children born. That's what the bottom line of that verse is. So then Abraham, Haran, Nahor, uh, Abraham, Haran, and I think Nahor was the other one, uh, they, they start to get born. All right, Nahor, uh, Terah start to bring forth children. So it could be that when Terah was 70, that Haran was born, the next brother was born, and then Abraham can come out much later on. See, so it can come out that way. So then, Abra so then right here, it doesn't necessarily, so then the starting point is wrong. Abraham was not zero when Terah was 70 right here. It could be that he was, uh, that later on, some time has passed even more. So then this won't have to match then right here. So then when he was 75, basically this should go here then. So not this number. So this number should go here, and then at that time, uh, Abraham uh, left his homeland. Okay? So that would solve out the contradiction. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm pretty exhausted, so that's why my throat is uh, not in good condition. I pray that you'll pull me through for the main preaching. I pray that today's uh, <clears throat> fellowship and everything else will glorify you and, 
edify each and every person and may each and every person be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.